Eastman, invite you to take your Bibles, uh, your Bible apps, and turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 9. Uh, Luke chapter 9, if you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you. Turn to page 1030, and you will find the Gospel of Luke chapter 9. Uh, by the way, if you don't have a Bible and you want to read the Bible, then take one of these. It's our gift to you. We want you to have the Word of God, be able to read the Word of God, because we know if you do that, uh, it will change your life. Uh, a few minutes ago, Robert mentioned some of our mission activities, and I wanted to mention one more uh, this morning as we get started. Uh, in, in a few weeks, I'm going to be traveling to Mozambique in Africa to do some uh, training of pastors and church leaders, uh, along with a couple of other pastor friends of mine. And, uh, and when I go, one of the things that we're going to be doing as a church at, when I'm there is we're going to be uh, putting in a water well in a village that doesn't have one. And uh, that's because you, this is a generous congregation, and we have the funds to be able to do that. I'm actually teaching on generosity when I'm there, and so uh, what better way to, to demonstrate that than to go and say, hey, not only are we going to come and tell you what God's Word says, we're going to do it uh, right in front of you. And so we're, we've, uh, uh, that cost about $3,000, and we're going we're gonna to provide money to do that. Now, the cool thing is, when our kids were at camp, they were uh, working with the same missionary that I'm going to be working with, and they helped to raise about $7,000 for uh, more than two wells to be able to put in. And it occurred to me that some of you might share that kind of passion, and you might want to get on board, and Calvary might want to be even more generous. And so I'm sharing that with you so that if that's something you would like to do, if you'd like to help put in a well in a village in Africa that doesn't have one, it's part of an evangelism strategy because not only do we put a well in for clean water, but we usually put it in right by a church. And so that church not only can uh, offer them clean water, but can offer them living water as well. So uh, if that's something you'd like to do, uh, I'm leaving the 1st of September, so you got a couple of weeks. Uh, just designate a check, put Mozambique on there, make it out to Calvary, and, uh, and we will take those funds with us, and we will help to do, uh, we're, we're going to help to do at least three wells and maybe more as, uh, as a church and as our youth group have, have done that. So I just wanted to make that uh, available to you and let you know about that. There's more information in the bulletin, or you can email me if uh, you want to know more about it. So have you ever had a weird church experience? You know, just uh, every service, people kind of giggle and laugh and nod and, and stuff like that. If you grew up in church, everything just seems normal because that's your church. That's how you grew up. I mean, I grew up uh, Southern Baptist, and I was in Southern Baptist churches all across the United States of America, and, and they were all pretty much the same flavor. I mean, you know, they sang the same songs, kind of did the same order of service, kind of, you know, had the same Sunday school curriculum. It was, so it was kind of uniform. You know, there was slight differences, kind of like the difference between eating chocolate ice cream and chocolate with almonds. You know, it's the same flavor, just a few more nuts. And... Uh, and, and, and so that was my experience, but as I grew older, then, you know, I started getting invited by friends uh, and visited other churches, and I'd just be honest, uh, you know, I'd grown up one flavor, and those other flavors kind of freaked me out. You know, first time I went to a Catholic church, and I was completely and totally out of my element because I didn't know when to, you know, kneel, when to get up. People, you know, statues all over the place, which if you grew up in a Baptist church, they're not into that. And, uh, you know, crucifix, and people are crossing themselves, and I was just like, wow, this is just weird. The other side of the spectrum, I went to a charismatic church, you know, and, and Baptists, the only time Baptists ever raised their hands in church was during a business meeting, and that was to ask a questioner to vote. And so when people are worshiping and they start raising their hands and, and there's some other noises going on, something like that, I was kind of freaked out. It just was not what was normal for me. And, and we're all that way because every tradition kind of has its way of doing stuff, and that's normal until you run into something that's different. But then I started thinking, imagine how weird it is for people who didn't grow up in church at all to come into church. Any church, almost anywhere, because, you know, churches are weird. I mean, Christians can be weird just by themselves, but you put a group of us together, it gets kind of strange, really. If you think about this from the eyes of the unchurched, some of you have never been in church before here, you can validate this, you know, your friends afterwards. You know, you know Christians kind of talk funny, right? Hey, brother, hey, sister, you know, and, and hallelujah and amen and, and all this kind of stuff. And people are like, what are you doing that's just weird and and, and you know we're kind of touchy people when we greet each other right i mean we've got greeters by every door you our, our job is to try to make you feel welcome when you get here but some of you do not get into all this hugging stuff right and and we know who you are because you're the ones playing dodge the greeters that hug 
you figure out which door is safe to come in, or you walk in with a crowd of people so you can try to get by them. We get that. It's all right. It's all right. And, and then where else than church do you sing as a group of people? I mean, think about this. you got to be at a sporting event because we all do the national anthem, and some of those cheers are kind of like singing together, right? Or, or maybe at a concert that you paid money to go to, uh, you, you'll sing because you know the songs, you like them, but they don't invite you to sing. They don't put the words up there and go, hey, sing. It's, it's weird. But you know when it really gets weird is the stuff that is, is actually kind of like the, the real meat of what we do here. Think about how weird baptism is if you've never seen one before. I mean, you walk into a church and you're like, why do you have a little mini swimming pool in the church? I mean, are there like jets in there for it to be a staff hot tub during the week? No, there's not. It's not a bad idea, but there's not. And, uh, and, and they're like, okay, so you're, you're going to dunk people in front of everybody else. And here's the creepy part. You think about this. While, while we're getting ready to dunk them, what are we talking about? Death. Hey, we're going to bury you in water. <laughs> I wonder if some of the unchurched people are going, are they going to let them up? Are we watching an execution or what? And they're like, pull them up. And they're like, sigh of relief. They let them up. It's weird. You think about it. But you know what gets really weird is communion. I mean, we celebrate communion, and it's just this beautiful experience of us remembering Christ and his sacrifice for our sins. But if you're unchurched, you've never seen this before. This has got to be weird. I mean, first of all, there's these little shot glasses and tasteless crackers. And you don't even know what's in the shot glass, okay? Let's just be honest about that. And, and then the, the people that are around you, they, they start talking about, you know, eating his body and drinking his blood. And you don't think that's weird? I mean, they're like, are we at a church that practices cannibalism or what? See, and we're laughing about that, but the early church, the early Christians were accused by the public of practicing cannibalism because they didn't understand the symbolism of communion. So sometimes it gets weird. It gets weird when we're as a group. It gets weird sometimes when we're as individuals because some people have strange, extraordinary spiritual experiences that when they share them with their friends, they sound a little weird. So today we're looking at a strange encounter with Jesus. Uh, Luke chapter 9, Gospel of Luke chapter 9, page 1030, uh, verse 28. This is called the Transfiguration. And, and I'll just tell you straight up, as a, as a growing up in Baptist churches, I never heard a sermon preached on this, ever. Because I figured it out, it's just too weird. Uh, it's too, you know, and Baptists don't do weird all that well. So uh, listen in, follow along, and let's talk about this weird, extreme spiritual event that Jesus had. Now, about eight days after, saying, uh, after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up on the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not really knowing what he said. And as he was saying these things, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken... Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent <clears throat> and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Now, that is a strange story. If you just break it down to its parts, Jesus is glowing. He's talking with a couple of dead guys. There's this mysterious cloud and a disembodied voice. Now, that's weird. All kinds of weird. So, the first question, if, when you read this, is why did Jesus have this strange encounter? I mean, what's the, what's the purpose of recording this in the Gospels? And by the way, three of the four Gospel writers include the story. They tell us about the transfiguration. So why did they tell us this story? I think there's three really obvious reasons, and, and I'm going to share those. Uh, I think there's probably more layered reasons, but 
just jumps out to me. First of all, Jesus had this encounter to encourage Jesus, to encourage him. Um, we all need to be encouraged. And even Jesus, who was God in the flesh, needed to be encouraged. I mean, he was facing a horrible death. He had the crucifixion in front of him. And, and, and so he has this moment with the Father and, and with two of the champions of the Jewish faith to say, you can do this. Let me encourage you. Let me help you. You can face this and do it. So uh, he has these key players. Moses, the lawgiver, the, the leader of the Exodus, the one who set the, the children of Israel free out of Egypt. I mean, he spent 40 years leading them. He knew a tough battle when he was facing one, and he was there. And he had Elijah, who is the, the king of the prophets, the greatest prophet that walked the earth uh, ever. And, and so they're there, and they're cheering Jesus on, saying, you can do this, you can fight, fight this battle, you can make it. And you know what this tells me? This tells me that if Jesus, the Son of God, needed encouragement, so do we. So do we. I don't know anybody who doesn't need encouragement. Every one of us is fighting a battle. And sometimes we're winning and sometimes we're losing. And every one of us needs encouragement. And if Jesus, who's God in the flesh, needs to be encouraged, uh, maybe we should focus our lives on encouraging those around us. On just trying to say, hey, are you, are you doing okay? Are you struggling? Let me, let me encourage you. Let me build you up. Let me help you with these words. Because the world can tear you down and pull you apart. And we all need encouragement. Jesus was no different. By the way, if you're not familiar with Moses and Elijah, uh, you can read the story of Moses in the books of Exodus through Deuteronomy. It's a lot of reading. Uh, you can skip over the boring parts, but it's there. If you want to read about Elijah, he's in First and Second Kings. Old Testament stuff, First and Second Kings, beginning about chapter 17 in First Kings. And you can read their stories and, and understand they were significant in history. So first of all, this encounter happened to encourage Jesus. And secondly, it happened to reveal Jesus. Now remember, the disciples were discovering Jesus. They didn't know all this stuff about him. And Jesus is revealing to them who he is. Remember just a, a little before this, there was the, the calming of the sea uh, on, on the Sea of Galilee, the calming of the wind and the waves. And they said, who is this that he has the power over the wind and the waves? So Jesus is showing them who he is. And what does this encounter reveal? First of all, it reveals that Jesus is God. The Father says, this is my Son the chosen one. He's the Messiah. He is God in the flesh. And, and so they began to understand he's, he's God. And because he's God, he's eternal. Jesus is eternal. I mean, think about this. He's talking with these guys, you know, Moses and Elijah that lived 800 to 1,200 years before this. And, and Jesus knew them, and, and he's one of them. And there's relationship there. And so they're, they're kind of going, oh, wow, he's eternal. And Jesus is significant. Significant. Moses represents the law. Elijah represents the prophets. You're talking about basically the Old Testament. And Jesus is the next and greatest word from God. He's the word that became flesh and dwelt among us and revealed to us the glory of God. A and so Jesus is revealing who he is to his followers. And then, of course, the, I think the third reason, obviously, that, that the strange encounter is in Scripture is to instruct Jesus' followers. Did, did you notice verse 35? This is the only thing that's really directed to Peter, James, and John. It said, And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my Son, my Chosen One. Listen to Him. Listen to Him. Now, you wouldn't think that it'd be necessary after what Peter, James, and John had just seen that they would need God to tell them, hey guys, pay attention. Pay attention. I, I mean, think about this. They, they, uh, they'd seen Jesus' glory revealed. They'd seen Moses. They'd seen Elijah. And by the way, somebody asked me last night, how did they know they were Moses and Elijah? I went, that's a good question, because the text doesn't tell us how they knew. I mean, maybe when, when uh, Jesus saw them, he's like, Hey, Moses, my man, how you doing? Elijah, you know, give me a hug. I don't know. I, I mean, it really doesn't tell us. Maybe he's had introductions. Peter, James, John, Moses, Elijah, you know. I don't know. Maybe just, they just listened in, and they heard him talking about it. It, it. You know, they don't think they had pictures of them in their wallets going, Oh, that's Moses. Let me get him to sign his card. But they knew that they, who they were. And, and here they were experiencing this, and you wouldn't think at that moment that God would say, hey, what I want to remind you is to pay attention and listen. But they're 
so much like us because they didn't listen to Jesus. Do you know that Jesus told the disciples three times that he had to go to Jerusalem and be crucified and they never got it? They were shocked when it happened. They even resisted his plan. When at one time when he said, we got to go to Jerusalem so I can die, and Peter's like, no, we're not going to let you do this. They're just like us. They struggled to hear and understand what Jesus was telling them, even when they had this wild, mystical, spiritual experience. Now, while we're talking about uh, spiritual experiences, have you experienced a life-changing encounter with Jesus? Have you had that life-changing encounter with Jesus? Have you come to that place in your life where you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God, Savior of the world? Do you believe that He died on the cross to pay for your sins? It's personal. Do you believe that He was raised from the dead and have you made a commitment to follow Him with your life? Because This is the significant thing. We want you to know that you've had this relationship with Jesus because we want every person to know the love of God, the forgiveness of sin, the hope of eternal life. And I know that we all meet Jesus differently. Now, don't hear me wrong at this point. There is one Savior only, period, and that's Jesus. There's only one way to heaven, and that's Jesus. There's no other name given among men by which we must be saved other than Jesus. But we meet Jesus in really different ways. Uh, For instance, how many of you share this story? You grew up with faith. I mean, maybe you grew up in the church and you were surrounded by people who loved God and who modeled what it was to follow Christ. And and you you embraced Jesus, uh, maybe as a child, maybe you, you know, uh, accepted Christ, got baptized, maybe you were confirmed. Whatever your church did, however they did it, you did that. But you really honestly don't remember a time in your life when you didn't know Jesus personally. Hey, who's got that story? Because that's my story. Okay. Hands are going up all over. Nobody, you know what? I've noticed this. Everyone in that group doesn't raise their hand high. They're all like, raise their hand like this. But that's good. We got other groups. They'll raise their hand differently. Uh, Or maybe your story was this. You grew up with faith. You you grew up in the church. You grew up with faith and people who love God. But you walked away at some point. I I mean, you just abandoned it. Maybe for a season. Maybe for a year. Maybe for a decade. Maybe for a lifetime. But then you came back to Jesus. And when you came back to Jesus, you took hold of him. And you're not going to let go for anything. And he really altered your life. And he's redeemed your mistakes. And and you're at a place where you're just like, yeah, I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Who's got that story? Yeah, see, they always put their hands up higher. Now this next group gets crazy, though. Maybe your story is this. Maybe your story was that, that you were far from God. I mean, you didn't grow up with faith. Uh, you didn't care about it. You were traveling at high speed in, uh, uh, to the highway of hell, and suddenly, wham, Jesus just interrupts your life. And you were changed dramatically. You were changed suddenly. You were changed quickly. In fact, people can't even believe it. They're like, what in the world happened to you? Uh, who's got that story? Yeah, see A lot of you do. Or what about this? Maybe you met Jesus slowly. You know, you didn't grow up around faith. You didn't really do the whole church thing. But you had some friends that were Christians, and you kind of liked them. You kind of liked their life and and what they represented. And so you started hanging out with them, and they got you to come to church. And at first you were a little skeptical, and you kind of stood back. But you kind of took things in, and you evaluated, and you watched, and you just kind of hung out with them. And, And somewhere along the way, it became real to you, and you just kind of said, yeah. And maybe you don't even know exactly when that was, but now you know, I, I'm in. This is, this is my family. This is my faith. How many of you have that kind of story? Yeah. You see, four wildly different kinds of stories, and I know there's other types, but those are kind of the, the four main categories that I could see, that I hear from people sharing. Same Savior, different ways that we meet Him, different ways that He changed our lives. So here, here's my challenge for you. Over lunch today, uh, you guys talk about how Jesus became real to you. Which, which one of those categories, or maybe you have your own category that doesn't fit any of those narratives that I kind of shared, and just kind of tell the stories of, of how Christ changed your life. But the truth that I want all of us to grasp is this. That we meet Jesus is more important than how we meet Jesus. That you meet Jesus is far more important than how you meet Jesus. See, it doesn't matter if you were on your knees at an altar in a church uh, or whether you were in Starbucks. 
It, it doesn't matter if you prayed the sinner's prayer or simply said, yes, I believe that. It doesn't matter if you were broken and emotional and, and tears were flowing or whether it was a calm, rational decision that you made. How isn't important. All that really matters is that you know that you've experienced a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And if you're not sure, or if you haven't, you can start right now. You, you can just simply say, God, uh, I want to begin this journey. I, I believe in Jesus. I'm, I'm wanna, I want you to change my life. And he will do that. You, you want more than that? Then, then find one of the pastors after the service. We're going to be at the Connection Centers out front and in the student wing. Let us talk with you. The prayer team will be here at the front after the service. Let them minister to you. Let them help you uh, be certain that you've experienced that life-changing relationship with Jesus. Don't miss that opportunity to experience Christ in a real way. Finally, let's, let's take a moment and revisit the weird. I want to talk about how to respond to a mystical experience with God because this text is about a mystical experience that Jesus had and some of the disciples were a part of it. And, and some of you in this room have had some kind of mystical, extraordinary spiritual experience. I mean, maybe you spoke in tongues. Maybe you had a, have experienced supernatural healing. Maybe you've had dreams or visions. Maybe you've had a near-death experience. Maybe an angel appeared to you, or Jesus appeared to you, or maybe you've heard God speak audibly. I'm talking about the kind of spiritual experience that when you share it with somebody, <laughs> sometimes they go, that's really, what's the word? Weird. weird. Yeah, that's really weird. So what do you do with this experience? And, and if you haven't had one of those, how do you respond to other people who've had them? So let's take a minute, minute and talk about how to respond to a mystical experience with God. First, and, and by the way, these are all from the text. This is just what, the, what we learned from the disciples and Jesus. First of all, appreciate it. Appreciate it. I, I love Peter. Peter is, is so us, Right? Listen to him, verse 33, and it says, As the men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Man, he is happy to be there, isn't he? It is good that we are here. Hey, let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not really knowing what he said. In other words, he was just kind of overcome in the moment, and he was just being sort of a moron. Uh, it's good that we are here. Peter was excited to be present. He was thrilled. In fact, he was so excited to be there at the transfiguration that he got kind of dorky. Right? Did you notice what he said? How about I build three tents and we have a sleepover? <laughs> Grown man, right? I'll, I'll, I'll make these up. I'll, what's he going to make them out of? He, doesn't, he didn't show up with a bunch of supplies. He didn't bring his tent with him. Jesus didn't tell him, hey, we're going camping. So if you have a mystical, spiritual kind of experience... Be thankful. Be grateful that you had it. It's not a normal thing. Everyone doesn't have them. Uh, notice the numbers in the story. How many disciples, uh, and we're talking about uh, out of the 12, how many of the apostles were present at the transfiguration? Three. Peter, James, John. Okay. Three were present. Uh, and, and how many disciples were total? 12. There are 12 apostles, right? So 12 guys, three were present. That means that how many disciples weren't there at the transfiguration? Now, you guys did math better out loud than the other services. Let me just tell you that. Okay, so three got to experience that. Nine were absent. Now, without running some kind of legitimate survey, but just having talked to lots of people about their stories and their lives, I'm going to guess that our percentage of wild spiritual experiences are kind of like the apostles. About 25% of the people in this room have probably had some kind of out-of-the-box, mystical, spiritual experience with God. And the rest of us haven't. Uh, now, think about this. Were these three better than the other apostles? Were, were they holier than the other apostles? Were they more mature spiritually than the other apostles? No. No. I mean, God used all of the apostles significantly, with the exception of Judas, you know, kind of the betrayed Jesus. Even that God used. 
But, but they all made a difference. They all made an impact. They all were a part of building God's kingdom. In, in fact, when you really stop and look at these, uh, they, they weren't better. In fact, you could argue they were worse. I mean, Peter, what did he do the night Jesus was betrayed? He denied knowing Jesus three times. James, by the way, uh, who was there at the Transfiguration, who was there at a couple other miracles that nobody else got to be at, um, he was the first apostle to be martyred. He didn't have a chance to build up the church. He died pretty quick. So uh, understand that you just if, if this happens to you, appreciate it. Be thankful that you got to experience it uh, because you got to be there. It's good for us to be there. Now, if you don't have those kind of spiritual experiences, don't, don't worry about it. You're in the majority. That's normative. But also don't be dismissive towards those who have those kind of experiences. Second response, if you have that mystical experience, keep silent until appropriate. Look at verse 36. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. Uh, imagine the damage that would have been done if the three had come down from the mountain and said, you guys missed it. I got to hang out with Moses. Here's his autograph. I got to hang out with Elijah. Jesus was glowing. We saw his glory revealed. This was so awesome. You guys missed out. That would have damaged the, the 12. It would have brought uh, pride and envy and jealousy into play. And that wasn't the purpose of this event. By the way, who chose which disciples went along? Jesus chose. Peter, James, and John, come with me. Who chooses whether or not we get to have uh, a mystical experience with God? Yeah, Jesus chooses. The last time I checked, he's not passing out a sign-up sheet. Who wants to have a wild spiritual experience? Come on, sign up right here. No, it, it's something that God chooses. We don't choose to do it. So, uh, by the way, some churches want everyone to have mystical experiences with God kind of to validate their experience. And by the way, every church wants you to experience God their way. It's natural tendency to, for us to say, this is how I experience God, so you should experience God the same way that I experience God, so here's the box we want you to fit in. And that's not Jesus. We already talked about it. We, we've all met Jesus in different ways. We have different stories, different paths uh, that to get to Jesus, who is the one and only Savior. Uh, so, that, you know, there's not a normative way of doing it. So if anybody tries to tell you this is the way you have to experience it, that's not Jesus. It's not Jesus. So appreciate the experience, and when the appropriate time to share comes, you'll know it. God will make it very clear to you that you need to share your experience. Maybe it'll heal somebody else. Maybe it'll encourage somebody else. Maybe hey, God gave you something to tell. So I, I don't know what, but, but here's the thing. You will know it. Uh, by the way, one of the things that's interesting is that of the four gospel writers, the one who was present at the transfiguration, John, didn't write about it. He's the only one that didn't write about it. He was there, and he didn't record it. The other three weren't there. I mean, I mean uh, a couple of them weren't, you know, there at all. But, uh, but they didn't record it. He didn't, he didn't write it down. The other guys did. But they told them about it when it was appropriate. So if all you ever talk about is your special spiritual experience, you've kind of missed the point, and you're being led astray by pride. On the other hand, if you disbelieve and scoff at other spiritual experiences, then you're being led astray by pride and maybe some envy. You see, our spiritual maturity is not measured by the coolness of our spiritual experiences. It, our spiritual maturity is not measured by the special knowledge that we have about God. Our maturity is measured by obedience. Which is why the Father reminded them to do what? This is my Son, my chosen one. Listen to Him. That's the third response, by the way. Third response, listen to Him. I'm going I'm to read it again. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my Son, my chosen one. Listen to Him. Listen to Him. It's not about the mystical experience. It is about our obedience. 
If you have a mystical experience with God, what does God want you to do? Is he encouraging you? Is he comforting you? Is he sending you? Is he rebuking you? Is he teaching you? Uh, the thing is, if you have this experience, there is a point to it. So listen and do it. By the way, that's true for all of us. You see, that message is for me and you, whether God spoke audibly to you or not. Whether you heard his voice or whether you, like I do, hear him speak from Scripture. Listen to him. Listen to him. And, and if, by the way, if you want to hear from God, I mean, you would really like to hear God's voice. The clearest, plainest way for you to hear the voice of God is this book. Why do you think we want you to read it? Why do we think we want you to engage it? Because this is what we call the Word of God. Let me put it another way. You use words when you're speaking. So if you want to hear God's voice, read the Bible. Let me say that again. If you want to hear God's voice, read the Bible. And He will speak to you. And sometimes He will, he will speak harshly and say, Stop it! And sometimes he will encourage you, and sometimes he will wrap his arms around you and just remind you that he loves you, and sometimes he will cheer you on and say, good job, keep going, and sometimes he will say, hey, you need to know this. I want you to, to learn this about me. But God will speak to you, and the question is this, are you listening, and will you obey? Whether you have the wild spiritual experience or not, will you listen and will you do it? Let's pray.